what's up guys the ufc and pfl fights have wrapped up and um a lot of decisions on both cards good main events like these are one of the few cards where the main events delivered and the rest of the fights not so much on the ufc card there were only two finishes the main event anthony hernandez tko'd michelle Pereira in a amazing performance from him and not an amazing performance from michelle who gassed out very quickly and jocelyn edwards had a submission win against vidal in the third round that was a fun fight to watch as well but let's start with the main event anthony hernandez finishes michelle Pereira by a tko in the fifth round and it's gonna be very hard for any middleweight to beat this guy when you just think about it iron chin crazy cardio relentless pressure technical well-rounded can box can wrestle, can grapple, can do pretty much everything. He's just not that fast with some of his techniques, and he's not that big. Well, in that fight, he didn't look big because Michelle is massive. Even Fluffy was saying in the fight, the guy felt strong for so long that some of his techniques weren't even working because of that. And Michelle was using his strength and size in order to defend takedowns, for an example, in the first round. A lot of it wasn't on technique. A lot of it was just pure brute strength. And that causes him to gas out. When you're not using good technique, but instead you're wearing out your body by exerting strength, it's going to make a fighter like that gas out faster, especially someone who has like one to two rounds of cardio. Michelle Pereira never really had that kind of cardio to last five rounds with Anthony Hernandez. That's why I picked him as a confident pick, right? I thought he was going to dominate the fight just because he has an iron chin, crazy cardio, and Michelle Pereira doesn't have good cardio. That usually beats that power puncher, right? And what a one-sided fight that was. I mean, Anthony Hernandez nearly landed 300, or he almost threw 300 total strikes, landed over 200 strikes, 10 takedowns, shot 29 times in the fight, 15 minutes of control time, just a complete domination that we rarely see in the UFC these days, right? Not many times we see a guy just absolutely beat someone from pillar to post outside of like a body kick and a flurry afterward, right? Michelle Perra had like one moment in the first round, but Anthony Hernandez was sticking behind that jab, doubling up on it, tripling up, quadrupling up on his jab. He threw jabs like John Jones throws eye pokes. He just fought by the basics and drowned or drowned Michelle Pereira. I love some of those like spinning kicks to the leg and stuff. Anthony Hernandez coming out with some really good technique in that fight. And I think it's going to be difficult for some of these other middleweights to beat him. Like imagine him fighting Roman Delizze or Paulo Costa or any other fighter who doesn't have the best cardio. I think his hardest fights are obviously going to be like Drickus, maybe Strickland, fighters with good cardio, at least defensively uh, well-rounded. Like uh, Strickland, he has good takedown defense, but a much better ability to get up from the ground. And he has better boxing than Hernandez. Where Drickus can fight Hernandez at every part of the game, I think Hernandez might have better boxing, but that is never a thing with um, Drickus Duplessis. He can outbox the best boxer in the world. I wouldn't be surprised if Drickus knocked out Alexander Usyk somehow with his Looney Tune style, man. He could be anyone in the world. But I think Drickus is Hernandez's hardest matchup just because he's bigger, he's stronger, he has the cardio go five rounds, he's also well-rounded, and he doesn't need to knock you out in order to win like Michelle Pereira does, right? Michelle Pereira has to finish you in order to win his fights. But Anthony Hernandez has, again, a really good chin and he's very good on the ground. That's why I thought Hernandez was a easy pick to win this fight. And for their next fights, so Anthony Hernandez is ranked number 13. I think a fight with either Roman Delize or maybe Paulo Costa would be a good one. And as for Michelle Pereira, a fight with Chris Curtis? Wait, aren't they training partners? He was in his corner. I guess Michelle Pereira versus a non-ranked opponent. I guess um, maybe the winner of Bo Nickel and Paul Craig. That would be a pretty interesting fight. And then we go to the co-main event where Rob Font does it again. He beats Kyler Phillips by a decision. This is the second time they put him up against a young up-and-comer and he beat them. The first was Adrian Giannis and now Kyler Phillips. I thought Phillips is probably going to win this fight, but never bet against Rob Font when he's going up against a young fighter. Single collars. So he was like extending his lead arm, using it as a guard, but also pulling down Kyler Phillips' head for either an upper uppercut to the head or an uppercut to the body. Really tricky technique that Kyler Phillips wasn't really adjusting to that well. Like Phillips would throw hooks, Ronfa would throw in his jab, but grab onto the single collar, clinching up, and then uppercutting right to the body. And he always put on the pressure, like early pressure in every single round, taking away any kind of cage control from Kyler Phillips until Phillips eventually was taking the fight to the ground. And those takedowns came very, very easy for him. Some good intercepting body kicks and even going to the body with the jab under Kyler Phillips' jab and sidestepping high kicks and stuff. Ralph Hunt looked really good in that fight, man. And I think a great move going with uh, the Zahabi brothers, because both of them, I think, uh, trained with him for this fight. Just beautiful body work all together. As for their next fights, Ralph Hunt's ranked number 10. Have him fight Mario Batista. The right next to each other in the rankings Batista's one spot higher and as for Kyler Phillips maybe him versus Jonathan Martinez or Montel Jackson and then we go to Charles Johnson putting on a performance against Sue Madarji yo what happened to Charles Johnson 
How did he just get so good out of nowhere? This guy was on a three fight law streak and now is just fighting like a top tier striker. And a lot of it comes from his pressure. You saw that in the Joshua Van fight. And now here against Sumadarja, who's also a very good striker. He was landing a lot of good shots. Left straights, good jabs, low kicks to the calf. But Johnson's blitzes were very effective throughout the fight and only got more effective as the fight was going on. And the combination in the second round blitzing and then land the uppercut hook drop sumer darji then nearly got put into a triangle choke and an arm bar he was able to defend that and then the arm bar afterward crazy scramble and just overall exchange between johnson and sumer darji then from the clinch eventually johnson was able to take him down then in the beginning of the third round sumer darji coming out with jabs left straight eventually goes to the spinning kick to the head grabs johnson's leg trips him out i mean just an insane fight man Love this fight. And Johnson's defense during some of those exchanges as well. Switching stances just to avoid the punches of Sumer Darji was very, very good. Like, very cool stuff. Showed his wrestling out there. Showed his striking. His clinch work in the third round. Great fight by both fighters, man. And I think Charles Johnson should fight a top 15 opponent. Maybe Matt Schnell if he's going to um, continue to fight. I think he said he was going to retire. But then I thought I heard that maybe he wasn't. So if he's still going to fight, that would be a good fight for... Uh, Charles Johnson. If not him, then maybe they can do Bruno Silva or Tagir Ilampakov. Obviously, Asu Almabayev is the logical next fight for Charles Johnson, but I don't want to see two rising contenders fight each other this early in their careers. And then we go to Cameron Smotherman defeating Jake Hadley by decision. This is a short notice fight. Hadley was supposed to fight Brady Highstand, so he went from fighting a wrestler to fighting a striker, which is his area of expertise. I mean, 30-26 is crazy. Against a guy on short notice who a lot of people didn't view that highly. Smotherman is not a bad fighter, but Hadley's supposed to be a talented fighter with really good skills. And Smotherman coming in short notice, the guy who got knocked out in a minute on the Contender Series uh, like a year ago, I think. He went to a split decision earlier this year against some fighter in Fury FC. But honestly, Smotherman fought very well. They both fought patient at distance, just lining up the right hand. Smotherman landed good jabs, a few good left hooks, slipping Hadley's punches, and beat Hadley in his own game. And it looked like whenever Smotherman was stringing together his combinations, Hadley was just so flustered defensively. Like, he didn't have many good counters. He didn't have many good defensive mechanics just against what Smotherman was throwing out there. So good performance by Smotherman. A lot of fans seem to be a little bit um disappointed in Jake Hadley's performance. And then we go to Darren Elkins defeating Daniel Panetta by a decision. Darren Elkins still doing the thing, man. Crazy. As tough as ever. Survived that guillotine in the first round. Even got mounted in the first round. Getting swept by a leg kick in the second round. Constantly fixing his hair, which I think is a um boxing habit he had. There's some fight who have this sort of habit in the training room like um Diego Lopez he touches his neck and Darren Elkins seems to be brushing his hair every single time he has some distance between him and his opponent and honestly when you look at some of the highlights of the fight it makes you think that Darren Elkins lost but then you look at Daniel Panetta's face and it's like what happened I think um wasn't the headbutt or wasn't an elbow that caused the, the swollen eye but even Daniel Panetta he like threw a back fist in the second round got taken down for it he kept pulling the guillotine which got him taken down very hard to smith someone like Darren Elkins and even walking into punches like that one two in the third round he literally walked into two punches like that if Elkins had punching power like Josh Emmett that fight would have been over and bro Elkins hustled to a win in that third round because it was like one apiece one to one Elkins tried everything he could to win that third round and it was enough sometimes just working harder and around trying everything you know throwing punches going for takedowns exchanging trying to counter just exert your entire arsenal in the final round is exactly what Darren Elkins did, which a lot of fighters don't do, right? Some championship level fighters that we know of don't have that level of urgency in the final round, but a veteran like Darren Elkins does. But shout out to both fighters, man. They made it a great fight and Daniel Panetta retired. He's had a lot of fights in his career, 39 years old, always tries to put on a really good fight and respect to him, man. I hope him the best after his uh, fighting career. And as for Darren Elkins, I don't know if he's going to continue to fight. If he does, I'm all for it. You know, just if he could put on bangers like that, it's always going to be fun with him around. And then we go to Asu Amobayev, defeat Matthias Nikolaou by a decision. This was a much more different fight. Not as much strikes thrown, not as many takedowns, but there, at least there was a knockdown. At least Almabayev did hurt Matthias Nikolaou, who just, he doesn't have a great chin. Such a technical striker, but he gets touched on the chin and he just falls every time. It's crazy, especially in the flyweight division too. It was a great combination by Almabayev though. Right uppercut, left hook that grazed, but the uppercut landed clean, dropped Matthias Nikolaou, and Nikolaou had that guillotine in the second round. It was a much slower paced fight, a lot more technical, kind of like a 
chess match in a way. You know, they were trying to find each other's openings in the entire fight. Amabaeva lunging with big hooks and stuff like that, but like the opposite kind of fight of Darren Elkins versus Daniel Panetta. But I enjoyed it. I like this fight a lot. I think Amabaev should fight Tim Elliott and Matthias Nikolaou. I don't know if he gets a top 15 opponent. Yeah, maybe a non-ranked opponent. He's been going up against some of the best fighters in the world, and I think he needs to step down in competition. And then we've got a John Matsumoto defeating Brakatona by a decision. Crazy pace this fight was. This was probably the fight of the night. Really close fight, competitive throughout the whole thing. I also had it 29 to 28 for Matsumoto. He landed some big shots throughout the whole fight, man. It was because Brakatona kept staying still whenever he was throwing combinations forward. Like, he would enter in explosively, but then sit there after his combination was over, and that's when he would get countered. I think he expected that his shots would rock Matsumoto or back him up, but they rarely ever did. Matsumoto was ready to exchange with Katona the whole fight, but he had nasty elbows in the first round, really good hooks, but Matsumoto was landing good one-twos in the second round that one of those hurt Brakatona. It like stunned him a little bit before he went for a takedown, but Katona was landing his own one-twos in the first round. Great elbows off the clinch. Just an amazing fight altogether, man. And then we go to Jocelyn Edwards defeating Videl by a submission in the third round. Edwards took her down in the third round, and then Videl was going for a leg lock, didn't have a full grip of the submission, and then got ground and pounded, rear naked choked, and that was it. And Edwards showed good distance management in the first round, but not the greatest fight in the world. Elise Reed also showed good distance management, winning a fight by a decision against Jessica Penny. Penny was trying to exchange punches, but Elise Reed was just the better striker of the two. Really good sidekicks to keep Jessica away, got the distance down like from the first round even, and barely even reacted to some of Jessica's punches, like she wasn't swaying back all the way and just moved her head slightly on the outside of punches and had really good defense throughout the fight. Melissa Martinez also wins by decision when she should have won by a TKO in the third round against Alice Ardelaine. She landed a body kick. Ardelaine tried to say, or the ref actually, the ref said that it was a low blow. Ardelaine also said that it was a low blow played it up as is, as it was, you know. But in the replay, the kick was clearly to the liver. And you can see that Arlene got hurt by a liver shot. Dominic Cruz must have been livid about um, Ref Peterson messing that up. He could have made that a TKO, but instead he allowed the fight to continue. And some people thought Arlene was winning the fight, right? Some people thought that Arlene may have won the first two rounds. But Melissa Martinez won by 30-27 on all scorecards. I like the kicks she was throwing out there. Fought just like a Taekwondo fighter. Throwing out a kick and then chambering it. Throwing out another one after. It's something like tech and combos. And then Austin Lane defeats Rebellas de Spain by a decision. He just wrestled him. He just took him down and held him down the whole fight. Bro, if Rebellas doesn't understand that his opponents are always going to wrestle him in every fight, then I don't know. Like, uh, uh, he should be just training grappling. He's got the striking down somewhat, but he has no takedown defense and he has no grappling defense. Like, Austin Lane was able to get full mount easily. Rebellas with those long legs allowing a guy to get around his guard like that, even out of half guard, like it's insane. Insane. Well, that's the hype train of uh, Rebellus Despain. Gone like his takedown defense. I don't even know if he can beat anybody else. He beat Josh Parisian, but that just might mean that Josh Parisian is the lowest level heavyweight in the UFC ever, maybe. Bro, I think... Like, if Rubellas fought Tank Abbott right now, he'd probably get taken down. It's funny because Rubellas de Spain is kind of like some of these kickboxers that, you know, everyone thought that they were going to get taken down and just held down the whole fight. Rubellas is like the only kickboxer that's happened to. It didn't happen to Isra Adesanya or Alex Pereira or we'll see with Kaya Sakura and we'll see with some of these other strikers. Rubellas de Spain and James Tony are like the only strikers that came in the UFC and just got wrestled easily in all of their fights, except the one that he won. And then we go to the PFL. Main event was amazing. Co-main event was pretty good. The rest of the card was just a sleeper. Francis Agano got a really good knockout. Pretty much Habib his opponent. Back of the head shots did knock out Hennif Ahera, and the referee did allow a lot of unconscious punches. You know, while Hennifer Herr was out cold, Ngannou just laying down the hammer on the back of his head, on the side of his head while he's out. But Ngannou is probably the best heavyweight on the planet, and until anybody beats him right? Until the next fighter beats him, he's probably still going to be the best heavyweight on the planet. In the Coleman event, Chris Cyborg defeats Larissa Pacheco by a decision. That's the same Larissa Pacheco from the UFC that Jermaine Durandamy destroyed in one round and lost to Jessica Andrade as well. What happened to her chin? She couldn't take a shot from GDR, but she was able to eat a head kick, a flush head kick from Cyborg, and some punches that Cyborg's knocked out other opponents with many, many times. She's huge now. She's like double her own size that she used to be. Her voice is way 
way deeper. I can't say for sure that she's on steroids, right? But if there's any fighter in MMA right now that looks like they're on roids, she's like the number one fighter. I don't know if she is, but maybe she just eats horse meat on that Uberim diet. But that's crazy. She performed very well, though. I did expect Cyborg to win the fight, even though she was the underdog. And they were saying on the live odds that she was an underdog even going into the fifth round. Cyborg won four rounds out of that fight. And even the commentators, they were talking, they were like talking about how Pacheco was maybe winning the fight. It's close. It can go either way. No, it, no, dude. It was four to one. Four rounds for Cyborg, one round for Larissa. There's no close fight. And then Johnny Eblen defeats Fabian Edwards by a decision. This was not an exciting fight. It was very similar to Bilal's performance against um uh, Leon Edwards, but Bilal's performance was more exciting than Johnny Eblen's. And it's funny because both Leon and Fabian got slammed on their heads, right? But that was all Eblen was really doing. He was just taking the fight to the ground, trying to hold him down, hold him against the fence. That's what most of the card was, honestly. Most of the fighters on the card were just holding their opponents down with their wrestling skills. But Fabian Edwards, he lands some good strikes here and there, especially in the fifth round. But Johnny Eblen showed he's very tough. But does this answer if Johnny Eblen can fight the best of the UFC? Out of the top five, the only one I can see him beat is maybe the current version of Israel Adesanya. Maybe. And that's not a confident pick or anything. That's just, that's his best chance of beating anyone in the top five. The others he loses to. Like he doesn't beat Drickus or Strickland or Whitaker or Imovov. He could probably beat some guys in the lower top 10, maybe. He's a good wrestler. He's got decent cardio. He has a chin. And and okay boxing. Then what about Zafar Mosin with the upset win against Hussein Kadi Magomayev? 30-27s. Kadi Magomayev was almost a 20 to 1 favorite and he lost every single round to Zafar. Zafar stuffed the takedowns easily and just outstruck him. It was such an easy fight for Zafar Mosin. Again, like one of the biggest upsets of the year in terms of betting odds. And it wasn't that difficult of a fight for Zafar. Crazy. Then what about Paul Hughes defeating AJ McKee by a split decision? That was not a split decision or or it shouldn't have been. Paul Hughes definitely won that fight. I think 29 to 28. He looked really good in the fight. AJ McKee did not look that great. AJ McKee was like throwing out all these spinning attacks and even just spinning for no reason. Throws a kick and spins in slow motion. He got dropped in the first round by a clean uppercut. AJ McKee might just be better at featherweight. And the thing is, he's still in his prime right? He's not even 30 years old. And that's a second loss of his entire career. The other one was uh, Pitbull. Yeah, Paul Hughes looked really good. It wasn't the most exciting fight, but he defended a lot of the takedowns, then a good counter punches, and pretty much just denied AJ McKee's entire style. Then what about Ruffian Stas defeating Marcos Breno by a submission in the third round? Not an exciting fight. Very slow pace. Marcos Breno's trying to throw combinations. Rafael Stas being very defensive on the feet. And then Marcos Breno went for the takedown which was very strange strategy from him. He got reversed. Marfian Stas just hip bumped and rotated him over while standing up, grabbed the ankle. Breno turned around. Stas got his back, rear naked choke. Comfortable win for Rafian Stas. Then Maka Sharip Zainukov defeated Dedrick Sanders by decision. 30-26, just wrestled him most of it. Landed some good shots, but not an exciting fight. Ibrahim Ibrahimov defeated Nacho Campos by decision. 30-27s, not an exciting fight. Kind of just held him down the whole fight. And then and Taha Ben Dawood defeated Tariq Ishmael by a second round submission. By the betting odds, this is the biggest upset in MMA history. In the second round, Tariq Ishmael was a minus 8 thousand favorite minus eight thousand favorite because he was destroying Taha dominating him lent a huge ground and pound shots and then he gets triangle choked out of nowhere just Taha threw up a triangle and he won but those were the fight cards and overall they're all right I think the UFC card was probably overall better with just the total fights the Francis and Ganu knockout was the best fight out of all of them right it was the best performance like the best finish what an absolute legend that guy is man one of the greatest heavyweights of all time match up any single heavyweight against Francis Ngannou in their prime and I think Ngannou beats all of them. I don't think there's a single heavyweight in history that can beat Ngannou or at least the best version of Ngannou. What an amazing fighter he is man and I hope you guys enjoyed the fights and if you did make sure to give the video a like make sure to subscribe hit the bell for notifications and I'll see you guys in the next video.